and homeopathy like what Hippocrates espoused that, that, that Hahnemann built on. Those are not. So let's uh, move on. Hopefully this will change. There we go. Okay, this is what I first wanted to share uh, as well too. There are plenty of resources if you want to know about the coronavirus. And I'll be happy to share uh, pictures of the slide. You can take um, you know, the, the photo shots of, of this in the next slide as well too. Um, there are many, many resources that I've gone to, online resources. Robin Murphy, you've probably heard of him, a brilliant homeopath. He did a four-part uh, series about the coronavirus for, through the Center for Homeopathic Education. Uh, you can access it there. Andre Stein with the American Institute of Homeopathy. He's got a wonderful, wonderful presentation about the coronavirus. Jeremy Schur, you probably know of him with his work in Africa. He has a, another multi-part broadcast on the coronavirus and homeopathy. Uh, these are very remarkable. Robin and Jeremy specifically very much get into, and, and Andre saying, of course, to a, to a degree, uh, get into the, because we don't go by diagnoses in homeopathy, we go by symptoms. And, and I remember the first one, Robin Murphy's first one came out, it, it was middle of February or so, <clears throat> excuse me, very early on. And he was talking even then about the many symptoms of the coronavirus that are, 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 are right there with things, respiratory issues, bronchial issues, pneumonia. Uh, and so that's what, we, that's what we work on. That's what we need to work on. Here is something that was, I'm, I'm friends and colleagues, of course, with the editor-in-chief of the, the, um, Amedic, the American Journal of Homeopathic Medicine. And the summer 2020 issue is focused completely on the coronavirus. He's even got an article in there by a conventional doctor, a fully conventional doctor, just talking about the coronavirus. So you can find uh, the entire issue right here at this website. And of course, there's a couple of articles right on um, hpathy.com, one by Dr. Isaac Golden, a good friend and colleague of mine who actually spoke has spoken at all three of my conferences, and he was there in India. He frequently goes to India. You may have seen them in other places. And of course, you may have heard of Rajan Sankaran and his wonderful work. He's got another uh, article there. But here are, on the other side, a couple of um, places that I've frequented as far as information that you're going to hear that is widely spread about the coronavirus around here because we are in a conventional medical world. This Johns Hopkins University site uh, the, from their Center for Systems Science and Engineering. This has actually changed when I first started pulling this up at the end of January to what the, the information they were sharing then is different than the information that they're sharing here. They shared a lot more then. They don't share as much now, but I'm going to share a few slides uh, from that this particular site. But this is a great one as far as keeping up on the numbers, the statistics and everything. Of course, it's a U.S. site, so it focuses primarily on the U.S., but it does get to uh, go to a remarkable degree. You might be impressed to see how many stars are, are within India itself. As well, this is another one that not everybody knows about, but this is one from Switzerland where a doctor just says <clears throat> there's a value and there is a value in knowing the truth. Don't get caught up in the, in the hype. Let's talk about the truth. It's a Swiss doctor who put this one together. Let's look at definitions. Disease. Okay, when we talk about disease, what is disease? When you look at, uh, you never want to define something when you're in the middle of a panic about something. So you don't want to go by current definition of things. Uh, and so let's look at uh, the new, the Webster's Medical Dictionary, the new revised edition. I love this little book. Uh, defines disease as, this is from 2009, sickness or ailment caused by germs or viruses with consistent results. Pretty straightforward. Then we'll go to Yasger's Homeopathic Dictionary. If you don't have this one, I will very highly recommend you, you get this. It's, a, it's an amazing book, and I couldn't find it before uh, this here. I'd, I'd hold it up to show you a picture. But in any case, Yasger's Homeopathic Dictionary defines uh, disease as a derangement of the vital force, quoting Hahnemann directly there. Dis-ease, you've probably heard that, dis-ease, an illness or sickness, a disturbance in, in the structure of function of an organ, organ system, or part of the body. And he goes on to a, a lot more homeopathic detail about what we see as, as uh, what a disease really is. What about this word epidemic? 
epidemic. Let's see, the Webster's Medical Dictionary says, oh, an epidemic is a rapidly spreading disease that affects many people at one time in the same area. I like things that are simple. That's pretty simple when you look at it from 2009. You look in a, another wonderful book, uh, Dorothy Shepard's Homeopathy and Epidemic Diseases. Again, another great uh, book they have on hand. She defines an epidemic as widespread outbreaks of a disease affecting simultaneously a number of people in one or several neighborhoods and even whole districts, states, or countries. Let's look at this word here too, pandemic. And this one, it's about, I don't know, maybe eight or nine words, this whole definition. No, it's only three. Widely spread epidemic. That's all we need to know about a pandemic. It's simply a widely spread epidemic. So let's build on that. I really want to, to be honest, I get tired of how uh, negative <laughs> everything is, how scared we're all conditioned to be. Let's be positive about what we know in homeopathy because you know what? Things that we know in homeopathy have been working for more than 200 years. If you go back to Hippocrates and even earlier, you can say it's thousands of years old and it is still working. Here is a picture from the Johns Hopkins site the main picture uh, and a couple later pictures it doesn't have the outlines of the continents there so uh, just yeah we all know what the world looks like but in any case here's a picture that I took from yesterday at uh, 7 28 p.m central U.S. standard time uh, and this is where it stands and look at these numbers aren't they scary aren't they just frightening to look that there's been over 24 million global cases uh, annual deaths 829,000 you know you, you look at these numbers and you can be very very frightened and they're very glad about that <laughs> no but, but what what you need to look at and, and if you pull up this site again there's the link for it and i'll be happy to share with, with you if you if you uh would like to have a copy of this note these little arrows on either side of this that you can um, click on to find out more information uh the u.s uh excuse me the the, the deaths you can let's see it does show India here and yeah I'll show India in the next slide but in any case you can make this bigger so you can click on the different areas and find out what the numbers are there numbers can scare numbers are very good to know about but they can be scary when you don't know more of the picture behind them but this is what you'll see when you pull up the Johns Hopkins site um, let's look at some of the details again the global cases here here this is yeah global deaths, 60,472 in, in India. That sounds pretty scary, doesn't it? Well, just wait, just wait. Here's the global recovery, okay? Over 3 million have recovered in Brazil. Over 2 million, 2.5 million have uh, recovered in India. 2.1 million in the US. And here's some numbers from, uh, yeah, here we go, Sweden. Let's look at the numbers for what they really are. And let's look at this too. Here, in a, and I tried to take these pictures as good as I can. These are where our, the outlines of the continents kind of disappear. Taiwan has seen 487 cases with seven deaths. Guess what? There's millions of people in Taiwan. That's how much that they've had. Uh, here's New South Wales and Australia. That's, what's, that's where Sydney is. They have seen 4,000 cases with only 52 deaths. Uh, Tokyo has only seen 356 deaths. Uh, in South Korea, my, my, my oldest son lived in South Korea for a couple of years, has only seen 313 deaths. Every death is tragic. Nobody wants this to happen. But these numbers are low. And here's one more right in, I picked up Maharashtra. Uh, there, there have been that many deaths with that many cases. What we need to keep in mind as well too, I don't know how, uh, I can't speak for India and I won't even try. I just know that here in the United States, there is a real issue that is happening as far as what is an actual Corona virus case. A young man was recently killed in a motorcycle accident. Well, when they tested him, he managed to test positive for coronavirus. So how is his death reported? It's reported by a coronavirus. They're starting to get in trouble because of that over here because it has been so widespread. And I don't want us to be discouraged about it. I want us to be aware uh, that, that, that this is what's going on. They're being taken to task about it, which I think is very good and it's very, very timely. Oh, and one more here, New Zealand, only 22 deaths. Let's be positive about what we have with homeopathy. Further, and here's here's a page from the, from the Swiss site and there's that uh, address down there. 
just to give you a feeling for that, here it says, the only means to fight the plague is honesty. That's from back in 1947. This is what this, uh, this site is all about, just sharing what the honest numbers are, as honestly <laughs> as they can be shared. Okay, so this is just a, um, a sampling. In most places, the risk of death for the healthy general population of school and working age is comparable to a daily car ride to work. The risk was initially overestimated because many people with only mild or no symptoms were not taken into account. Anymore, they're talking too about, guess what, if you have no symptoms, you're not a threat. Don't worry about it. You don't need to worry about it. You don't have symptoms. Guess what? Hahnemann talks about that in the Organon. Okay, let's take that. Here's a couple other pay, uh, samples from, from the Swiss site. You can see that the estimated death toll of, of pandemics as a percentage of global population. And guess how low the COVID estimate is. And we hear a lot about, I don't know how much you hear in India about uh, what's going on in Sweden, but you can see where the numbers are compared to where the estimates have been. This is what we need to really grasp hold of and move forward with. We've got to be cautious, not careless. We've always got to be cautious. This is what we're taught in homeopathy. But this is what we've got to be aware of. This is something, pardon me for just one second. Family noise in the background, so. This is something that just happened earlier this week. I, sh I learned about, about this um, study that's been happening in Western India, in the state, let's see, in the state of Gujarat, where they have been treated, treated uh, 34 million, nearly half of the population of the state. And they found of those quarantined who were treated this way, 99.6% tested negative for COVID-19 when they were treated with arsenicum album. Here we go. What happened was, and let me just, if I don't know how well you might be able to see this. This is, I tried posting this on the HPWWC um, Facebook page. It was polled saying, and I quote, <clears throat> It, it goes against our community standards. We have these standards because ahem, misinformation that could cause physical harm can make some people feel unsafe on Facebook. Where is physical harm caused through this? I don't want to get angry about this. They're free to do. They will do what they're going to do. This is what we've got to work with. This is... In my opinion, they're having pulled this article, and I will very much encourage you, please, to find this article yourselves and share it on your own Facebook pages because this is tremendous news. Not to share this, I think, is doing humanity a disservice because this is not hurting anybody. Indeed, look at those numbers. It is helping. This is what we need to build on with homeopathy. So there's two primary schools of thought just to get into focus what we have with homeopathy and homeoprophylaxis. Um, and these are through history. We've had the empirical or the vitalist school and the rational, the materialist school. You can guess which one we're in the middle of right now. The imperial, empirical school uh, sees the body having an energetic essence, the vital force. Hmm, where do we learn that from? Okay, rational school sees the body as a mechan material, mechanical system, okay? We, uh, within the empirical school, it works to ho hold a homeostasis, a balance, okay? In the empirical, in, excuse me, in the rational school, we see extreme external forces majorly impacting the physical being. It happens from outside, that, that's affecting the body. <clears throat> the knowledge in both of these is an interesting approach. Knowledge in the empirical school is found through practice, through historical context, through studying things like, uh, you know, the organon, <laughs> okay, knowledge in the rational school, they experiment on dead organisms or living organisms in a laboratory setting, an unnatural laboratory setting. Now, do keep in mind, I am not faulting the other school because a lot of good is happening today. I personally went through two major surgeries just last year alone. <laughs> I'm very, very glad for the rational school. Oops, I let it out, but in any case, you know where we're at, okay. Again, in the empirical school, we study uh, people in their daily life. The doctrine of cure is by natural law. But in the rational school, 
physiological study of how sick and healthy organisms function is vital. You've got to do this. Uh, in the empirical school, knowledge of internal processes is impossible, not required for a cure. How much did Hahnemann not know that we now know today? But it was working even then. Okay. It, whereas in the rational school, knowledge of internal processes is required for treatment. Interesting, these approaches. <clears throat> if, through the empirical school, we discover through clinical practice, through the rational school, it's discovered in the labs. All right, so keep in mind, empirical's on the, on the left, rational's on the right. The definition of disease pertinent to today, definition of disease, let's see. The disease is a derangement of or imbalance of the vital energy of the person. Pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Definition uh, in, the, in the rational school, signs and symptoms that are considered statistically abnormal. That's what they look for. View of symptoms in the empirical school, holistic look for physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual symptoms. In the rational school, it's reductionistic. Usually in physiochemical terminology of psychological problem, it is often understood as a separate, as separate and vice versa. One of the most fascinating um, places of research that I did was into what we'll just call psychosomatic homeopathy. It is so important to know how much the psyche, how much mental issues do affect us physically. Uh, in, in, in the empirical school, symptoms are the organism's effort to heal a person. They're the body's call for help. Let's follow these. Let's follow these. Symptoms in the rational school are indication of something wrong with the body. We've got to get in and fix that. Well, when you've got appendicitis, you do need to get in and fix that, you know, but it, it, that doesn't even, that doesn't always need to happen that way, okay? So the cause of disease in the, in the empirical school, the proximate causes, causes close to the result are not causes. They are other effects. Proximate causes are not important in therapies that seek to raise resistance. Let's look at this. Let's consider this. In the rational school, they seek proximate causes of disease like internal, material, chemical, mechanical, or bacteriological causes. It's always something outside the body. Uh, the specific internal cause is always unknown, whereas in the rational school, the causes can be known. Environmental influences in the empirical school can be stressors, but internal predisposition is understood to make the person susceptible to the disease in the first place. What do we read there? Miasm, right? Whereas often external agents, the virus, the bacterial environment, are seen as the cause of disease. Just let this thing sink in as to where we are within homeopathy. In the sixth edition of the organized, in Aphorism 6, right at the beginning, Hanan says, what else do we want to cure in disease but the symptoms? We don't need to see it, but ascertain through its presentation that which we need to cure, collecting the totality of the symptoms. Aphorism 8, he goes further. Disease is a state of being of the organism dynamically untuned by a disturbed vital force, dynamically untuned, untuned. You gotta fix the body itself. That's why we have so many wonderful remedies, right? Aphorism 100, he goes into this epidemic. Every epidemic presents a new disease. We need to know the unique symptoms for each epidemic to ascertain the proper homeopathic approach. Except, and he, and he mentions these two specifically, those caused by some unvarying infections, including measles and smallpox. We can add things like chickenpox that cause the same symptoms among the same people. You know, I remember when all, me and all four of my uh, siblings came down with chickenpox. It was a very long two weeks for my dear mother, <laughs> but it was all the same symptoms. All right, uh, he expounds further on this in aphorism 240. We need to find an epidemic's own consistent nature common to the individuals affected. There, we may have another coronavirus outbreak, but guess what? It's going to probably cause different symptoms to happen. We need to look at those. We need to ascertain those and work with those. Aphorisms 101, 102, he gets into what we call today as the, the, the genus epidemicus. It gets more into that in aphorism 241. Just understand the genus epidemicus, that is a term that Hahnemann didn't coin. It was coined in Joel, Dr. Joel Shepard in an article in the um, American Journal of Homeopathic Medicine that I referred to earlier. He's, he points out that this phrase um, came from a J. 
J.G. Rademacher, a contemporary of Hahnemann, but he never accepted uh, homeopathic axioms. It's very, very good to find a Jevonus epidemicus, and I'll get more into this in, in just a little bit. But uh, Dr. Shepard points out too, to it, we should not be looking at a genus epidemicus as a silver bullet, as the one thing to find to be the, the, the cure of, of whatever epidemic, COVID-19. We need to be looking and considering uh, individual presentation as well. So looking at the totality of the symptoms, it's careful, meticulous assessment. This is what we in homeopathy have been doing since Hahnemann's time. Okay, this is why homeopathic researchers are to this day, more than 200 years later, still doing the same thing in situations in epidemic, uh, epidemics and pandemics, especially with this COVID-19. I'm working with many, many homeopaths around the world who are looking at this and looking at it very, very carefully. The fundamental homeopathic principles are not going to change. Here's just a fun, quick run through of, of several epidemics, pandemics that have happened through history. And just, uh, you can look at the numbers here. Uh, the first one, the Koenigsutta one, that's the one that Hahnemann, um, where Hahnemann first came across the use of uh, homeopathic medicines prophylactically, a, a bit of the fun story behind that too is, is how he, he was asked to come to Koenigsutta because there was an outbreak of the scarlet fever. He called this a devastating scourge. And and he and he in the in his lesser writings he gets into this, and let's see if I. Let's see. I apologize for the moment. In any case, he gets into uh, how he's able to help with a. Um, he finds with a young girl who had an affliction of her finger who was already taking belladonna, homeopathic prepared homeopathically prepared belladonna for this affliction, she wasn't coming down with this uh, scarlet fever. Three of her siblings had. That's why I went to her, her home because this young girl also, he found this remarkable because this young girl was always one of the first to come down with, with any disease that would hit this town and she didn't have it. Three of her siblings did, five of her siblings did not. Scientist that Hahnemann was, he decided to go ahead and treat those five siblings also with the belladonna and they didn't come down with it. And thus started the ball rolling with, with homeoprophylaxis. But something interesting too to note with all these numbers here, this 1854 epidemic of cholera is a very key one to be aware of. That's one where it's interesting at the beginning to note that this is one that the first epidemic on record where they were able to center it to one single source and this was a, a public water pump. When they closed that water pump uh, the numbers started depleting very very quickly but uh, the House of Lords wanted the, the, their medical profession to share with them the records of, of, of you know what, what's going on in your hospitals and they shared with them the records but uh, they, they noted the House of Lords noted well why aren't you including the homeopathic hospitals? And they were told, well, we didn't include them because those uh, numbers would skew our results. Well, the House of Lords put their foot down and said, you will share, share with us these numbers. And so they did. And you can see the mortality rate in the homeopathically uh, treated facilities was only 9%. 9% compared to 59.2% in the conventionally treated. And you can you can see they were probably a little bit embarrassed about that, but in any case, you can look this at uh, look at this. Consider what it is: 1918 uh, Spanish flu. This is only in one place in Pittsburgh, USA. 1.05 percent compared to 30 or more percent. It's very, very uh, significant to be looking at and considering this. One of our speakers, you may have heard of Dr. Raj Manchanda in, in India. Uh, I worked with him very closely putting this together and he's, I, I had a video of this um, where, he, where he said, Homeop homeopathy is known today because of how well it works prophylactically. A as well, and I will insert here, as well as how it works in epidemics and pandemics, okay? 
here's just, uh, again, as I was referring to earlier in his lesser writings, there's the cure and prevention of scarlet fever, where he gets into all this detail about um, the devastating scourge of scarlet fever. He expresses a lot. He explains a lot about this fever. It's amazing how much detail he was looking at, uh, how much he understood about contagious disease. He couldn't call it that because we didn't have that term at that time. Uh, he explained the symptoms he was seeing and noted that they, they were very similar to Belladonna and found a lot of success. And so here's this that I already just went over with you, with a, with a young girl, three of her siblings had it. All of her siblings, and this is a Hahnemann quote, he, they all remained perfectly well without the slightest symptoms throughout the whole course of the epidemic and amid the most virulent scarletina emanations from their sisters who lay ill with the disease. Okay, I reason thus, this is Hahnemann speaking, a remedy that is capable of quickly checking a disease in its onset must be its best preventive. Prevention is better than cure, we can say it that way. Hahnemann was saying that more than 200 years ago. So a few more of his words on this. One of my chief aims, he writes, in, this is in the uh, Cure and Prevention of Scarlet Fever. He says, one of my chief aims is to excite a great interest in a subject of so much importance to humanity as this. Speaking specifically about scarlet fever, but knowing the scientist that Hahnemann was, I am confident he was also thinking much larger than this too. He also said, who can deny that the perfect prevention of infection would offer infinite advantages over any mode of treatment, be it of the most incomparable kind soever. Another way of saying prevention is better than cure. So here's a couple of his uh, followers, Brenninghausen, having who worked closely with him as far as he began studying further into homeoprophylaxis, aphorism 33, he makes further mention of the scarlet fever episode saying, if medicines can protect us from the contagion of a raging epidemic, they must possess a greater power to alter our vital force than the epidemic. It's amazing to consider his own words. He also uh, pointed out that, you know, if, when we have another scarlet fever epidemic, we've got to take into account the individual symptoms. Uh, he, he talks about this in the same lesser writings observations on the scarlet fever. He speaks about this. We've got to know the individual thing. Again, there's not going to be a magic bullet, but this is what has been uh, found. The success of Belladonna at preventing scarlet fever helped Hahnemann and homeopathy gain renowned. 1838, the Prussian government called for the use of belladonna for the prevention of scarlet fever, probably with encouragement from the, from the king at the time, Friedrich Wilhelm III. Uh, and it's interesting to note here, uh, King Friedrich actually nearly lost his son to the, to the smallpox vaccine. So I'm sure uh, King Friedrich was very, very excited to learn about a possibility of preventing 43, the British Journal of Homeopathy, Volume 1. I have a copy of this myself. He, there, there's an article in this on the prevent, preservative properties of belladonna in scarlet fever by Dr. Francis Black of, of Edinburgh. There were 19 homeopathic physicians who gave it, each gave trial to this, each one of them having great success. This was widely quoted widely referenced to the point. Uh, I also have a copy of this book, The Logic of Figures. I will very much encourage you to find a, a copy of this yourself from 1900. It's available as an e-copy as well. Um, Dr. William Bradford was an American homeopath and medical doctor. He wanted to make a comparison between allopathic hospitals and homeopathic hospitals. And just put their numbers, not just for American hospitals, but European hospitals. He went over to Russia as well. It's an amazing, Compar a comparative book. Here's just a page, the page, and at page 31, where he gets into belladonna and scarlet fever. This is quoting uh, from, from the British Journal of Homeopathy, and, and you can see in every case that they had this, there was tremendous success. So uh, Hahnemann went on. He, he, he found in the lesser writings, you can also read about the cause and prevention of the Asiatic cholera. This is, he worked with Bunninghausen with this. This is where he learned about the effectiveness of, of potentized copper, the camphor, and how well this works for uh, cholera. Many other uh, homeopaths comment favorably about homeoprophylaxis. You can read about this in one of Dr. Golden's book, I's books, 
uh, vaccination and homeoprophylaxis, a review of risks and alternatives. That he, he's, he's got pages and pages of quotes, but I've got just a couple of them here that I'll share with you. Here's one from, you may have heard of James Tyler Kent. We must look to homeopathy for our protection as well as our cure. And these remedies will enable you to prevent a large number of people from becoming sick. And here's a gentleman, Dr. Arthur Grimmer, in 1949, he shared this, as the law of similars excels in the power to cure, it excels more forcibly and certainly in the art of disease prevention. And I just thought I would show this. This is a very interesting study that was done in Brazil, the very first, fairly recently, 1974, there was a privately funded study where they, uh, in, in to the meningococcinum for meningitis. There were 18,600 that they protected with HP, showing four cases of meningitis. Whereas there were 6,300 not protected with HP, saw 32 cases of meningitis. An effectiveness rating of about 86.1. Well, guess what? The Brazilian government learned of this. The Brazilian government decided in 1998, let's do another one of these studies and let's observe these um, children after 12 months to not just do a one-time thing, but see how long it lasts. So in 1998, 65,800 they protected with the HP, only seeing, again, four cases of the meningococcal infection. 23,500 not protected saw 20 cases. Uh, based on the attack rate, 58 cases of infection should have been expected in the HP treated group, but not. No, so here's what we're looking at. After six months, the rate of infection, effectiveness was 95%. After 12 months, it was still 91.5%. This is how good it really is working. We are in a very unique place today with, with homeopathy. We in homeopathy recognize the value, the need for disease. We're not well just because we never get sick. We've got to get sick. Okay, we, uh, but the label disease is an allopathic conventional label. Hahnemann talked about this again hundreds of years ago. The predominant thought governing conventional medicine today is surprise, surprise, it's the rationalist, the materialist view. We've got to work with that. There's no hiding that. Much good again has happened and is being done today because of where we're at with medicine. There's no doubt there. However, Many not so good things are also happening that we need to recognize. This because homeopathic principles are being ignored, being shunned. Holistic principles are being belittled. Maybe that's happening more here in the West than it is in India. I was very impressed with how closely you're working with homeopathy there. The prevailing thought within conventional medicine, something must be defined to its smallest point before something can be done. No, it doesn't. We can do something now. We need to be doing something now. Allopathic medicine tells us today that we cannot say that we have a cure. See, I work very closely with an attorney whose practice is right in Washington, D.C., and he, he helps me. Uh, he helps me a lot. He helps HBWWC a lot, and he works with our FDA a lot. But he says, yeah, we've got to look at this for what it is. In, in uh, homeopathic medicine, because allopathic medicine is the big one that we're working with. We cannot say, here in the West anyway, we have a cure for an allopathically labeled condition or disease. We cannot say we are able to treat an allopathically labeled condition or disease. We cannot say we can prevent an allopathically labeled or condition or disease. Yet, homeopathic medicines have been successfully doing exactly this. For symptoms, these allopathically labeled diseases have been presenting for more than 200 years. Every symptom that is being presented by the coronavirus falls into this. Homeopathic medicines have been working with it for years. This approach, approach we, we need to approach homeopathy today with great confidence because of its history. We need to have this, hold fast to this. Here's ideas to hold. Fast HP is designed to build and strengthen the vital force, and with this, educate the immune system. I love to use that phrase. That's a phrase that Isaac Golden uh, introduced, educating the immune system. Why we're doing this, okay? We're working with the body to strengthen the individual, to learn what it needs to. There's a reason why we need to get sick every now and again, 
it really is there really is uh, we need to avoid uh, as possible diseases that can permanently damage such as smallpox such as polio that can kill such as meningitis meningitis can kill within 24 hours after its contraction whereas the conventional approach basically uses fear we've got to avoid disease we've got to not get sick we've got to be well by avoiding this all well it's it's a it's a wonderful thought because it's never pleasant to get sick <laughs> but we've got to look at the whole picture remember though too that no form of prevention will ever be a hundred percent effective except for my husband will point out except for death well i don't want to go there okay uh but homeoprophylaxis holds a consistent track record of being about 90 percent effective that's comparable to any vaccine we need to hold fast to this so homeoprophylaxis it's homeopathic works with the law of similars as you've seen it works yeah here's the light cures like it also prevents like we use the minimum dose the effectiveness is right about 90 percent we need to work with conventional medicine because that's where we're at. Some homeopaths are trying to completely copy what conventional medicine presents for immunization. And let me emphasize here the word immunization. Please keep it clear that commonly used today are the words immunization and vaccination as if they were the same word. They are not the same word. Vaccination is a form of immunization. So is homeoprophylaxis. We don't like to call it homeopathic vaccination. It's much more than that. We like to call it homeopathic immunization. So keep that in mind because it works with the body. It is homeopathic. Unfortunately, again, some homeopaths try to completely copy what, co what conventional medicine is presenting. And this is unfortunate because we can do so much more than that. Uh, and in doing this, they're forgetting Hahnemann's call to strengthen the vital force to educate the immune system, to honor the divinely created body that we all have and it's God-given symptoms. This is what homeopathy does. This is, the body has this innate desire to be well. We need to work with that, with homeopathy. There's four primary approaches for homeoprophylaxis that I'll just briefly go into. Uh, individualization, this is the homeopathic gold standard where you find out exactly what Johnny here has, what, what Janie over here is exhibiting and you give them what, what they need. We, we do that in homeopathy. We, we've got to do it that way. We've got to do the individual picture. But when we're talking about an epidemic, something that's going around fast, that's not very practical. That's, that's the only problem there. Combination remedies. Excuse me, combination remedies. I use them very reservedly. You've got to be so cautious when you combine the remedies. But I do work with homeopaths around the world who like, like a homeopathic vet in, in the UK who does this for uh, HP. For, for the animals. And when we look at some of the tremendous studies that I haven't um, shared in this present presentation here, uh, but there was a tremendous study in India, uh, in Andhra Pradesh, that was done 1998 through 2000, and 2000. Within those three years, Japanese encephalitis was reduced to zero right there. And the remedy that they used in that tremendous study involving some 20 million children was a combination remedy. Okay, and, and a tr another tremendous study that was done in Cuba in 2007, 2008 against a terrible disease called leptospirosis. That was also effectively worked with with a combination remedy. You just have to be careful with common, combining remedies that you are meeting. What is there with presenting with the disease? Then we get to the genus epidemicus. Every time I present about this, that people are asking, do we have a genus epidemicus yet for the coronavirus? Well, the thing is, the coronavirus is a rapidly changing virus. And so the symptoms that are being presented in one area are not going to be the same symptoms that are going to be presented in another. And Isaac Golden talks about this. The genus epidemicus for uh, Mumbai may not be the same genus epidemicus that could be for Auckland, New Zealand, or Dallas, Texas. It, it, we've got to know this too. The genus epidemicus can be very, very effective, but it's not always the best approach either. And then there's the isopathy nozode remedy approach. Where this this approach is not not too unlike what conventional medicine uh, uses where we where we can say that we can use uh, Nat Mur for malaria. We can use this and we can 
in, uh, within homeoprophylaxis a worldwide choice, I do have a, a kit put together for uh, some childhood diseases. Uh, it can, and we use nozotin remedies for this. This can also be a very, very effective approach for homeoprophylaxis. Here is just a, a quick, a short sample of a few uh, remedies and nozodes that can be and are used for homeoprophylaxis. I just picked out uh, these diseases and some remedies, some remedies, and some nozodes that are used for these. And I'll point out this too, and Isaac Golden points this out as well. Um, interesting things like the malaria nozode and NATMER that also works preventatively. NATMER is something that was used since basically Hahnemann's time. Malaria nozodes we've, we've recently gotten to, but uh, Isaac Golden points out that the NATMER can actually be more effective than the, than the malaria nozode because the malaria nozode is one particular strain of malaria. I've used them both and I've helped people with uh, uh, HP for travel all around the world and they both been, have been very, very effective for this. Now, as far, let me also share with you as far as the Lathyrus sativus and the polio nozode for polio, it's the same story there. The Lathyrus sativus, every study that I've seen, and Dorothy Shepard gets into this too in, in her book, the Lathyrus sativus, whenever that has been used, has been right around 100% effective. So I'm not gonna tell you what to use. This is just a sampling that you can be looking at uh, as you move ahead. So again, knowing history helps us actually learn from it and improve where we are today so that humanity is therewith improved. Remember this phrase too, hardly anything is actually proven. Almost everything is simply assumptions. The biggest error in every field of science is the fact that so-called knowledge is nothing more than a current theory or model of thought. It's going to change. So hold fast to the principles that we know are not gonna change. Homeopathic principles haven't changed in more than 200 years. Here are a lot of references that I've, that, that I've, that I've used that I will recommend that you all look into as well. There, there's even more of these. I realized last time I presented about this, there's a couple that I missed on here, like um, Isaac Golden's website, which is home study, H-O-M, home study for homeopathic study, homestudy.net. He's got a lot of references there as well. And yeah, here's just a few things as far as contacting me if you want further information about specifically things that I get into and, and I'm happy to share with you. So that that's, there's our, there's our Facebook pages there too. So that is my presentation. Thank you, I appreciate your attention. And I guess, yeah, if there's any questions, I will be happy to, to answer these too. So do we have any questions for Kathy? So Dr. Bina is just mentioning a comment that Kathy, you're fantastic and very positive. <laughs> so, oh, thank you, I try to be. <laughs> all right, so do we have any questions for Kathy on anything that she presented at the moment? Dr. Rupal is asking that for COVID, uh, what would you suggest as a preventive or prophylaxis in your experience? Okay, well, and, and this is something that I will present with caution uh, as far as preventive. Uh, the one preventive that I have been using, there, there have been many, many remedies. And if you look at the, the references that I shared at the beginning, uh, you'll learn even more about them. Ones that are showing to be very, very good are arsenicum album, just the 30C potency, uh, bryonia, gelsemium, and even cuprum, and several others. The one that I have been uh, using primarily here in the US, uh, because it really, in spite of the numbers that you saw on, on, on the Johns Hopkins site, I'm not finding it to be the, the COVID to be a major issue here in the United States. What is a major issue over here is the fear that is so promulgated everywhere you turn, there's something else to be scared about, you know, the face masks and everything, uh, which I'm deliberately not getting into because there's a lot of, I, I can't believe the idea of face masks is even tearing families apart and best friends apart because they're not wearing a face mask. You know, let, let's look, beyond this, let's look at the bigger picture here 
Let's just focus on being well. So as far as preventive, um, the primary one that I have been using over here, and it's been, I've, I've, I've shared this with many me medical practices, many individuals as well, is simply the arsenic amalgam. Why? Because this one has a great propensity for working with the type of fear that we have to be working with now. It's great for the respiratory issues and, and many presenting symptoms for the COVID-19. But I think the fear factor is, is what we really need to be working with. That being said, I'm not closing the door and say, saying, boom, I found the answer. But, and, and, I, I, well, I, I'm keeping my, 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 my doors open to learning more. If somebody, when somebody, and I've worked with a few COVID patients, uh, and so what, what I need to do for each one of those, and I'm sure Preeti and, and, and Prajakti, you're going to share even more about this. I look at the individual symptoms. There is, unfortunately, one homeopathic pharmacy that has produced a COVID nozode. Why I say unfortunately is because this nozode was presented almost as soon as this epidemic was announced. And, and I see this basically as being, and they, they, they haven't been very open about sharing where they've gotten it and everything. I see this, it might work, it might work. A lot of people are trying to use this, but I'm not going to use it because I found that this is really more of a uh, jump in, oh, here's another way to make money. <laughs> no, I, I see there's too many homeopathic remedies that are going to work, that are working for homeopathic prophylaxis, <laughs> for, for, for that as well, but also for treating the COVID-19, treating and preventing the COVID-19. And that's what I'm going to stick to, and that's what I will encourage you to stick to as well. Thank you so much, Kathy. And so you bet. I think this was a good, um, what do you say, a starter to, you know, look back at history, to put things in perspective globally, and, you know, uh, how panic can, you know, take over our sane thinking. Yeah, sometimes yeah. Uh, we have all been through that stages, right? I mean, I have, I have been in panic phases a lot many times, more than what I would like to confess. Yeah, but... Uh, <laughs> We all have been, That's I think. That's what mass psychology does to us. Um, so Kathy is going to be here and keep, if you, uh, if you have more questions, let's park that. Uh, I'm going to, Prajita and I are going to share the, share some cases that we've had and how we've, uh, uh, how we've treated them. And Kathy, maybe you could add at the end your perspectives on those in terms of those remedies and uh, mm -hmm. how would you, you know, what does your experience differ or match to it, yeah? I'll be happy to. Yeah, I'm right. going to disappear. I have not yet had full, my, my full breakfast, so I'm going to disappear, but I'm still going to be here, but I'm going to go eat. <laughs> my, yeah. my microphone's still going to be on and everything. So. Yeah, yeah, sure. Definitely. Okay. Definitely. Okay. Wonderful. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, Prajukta. Uh, I'll share my screen, right? Yes. Okay. So, um, so, <clears throat> Let me know once you're able to see my screen. Yeah, we can see. Okay. So let's do it this way. So um, a lot of masters have shared, uh, you know, their experiences and uh, a lot of uh, us who are already on the call uh, have much more experience than us maybe right now in this. Uh, and we would really love you to, you know, uh, uh, share your experiences and comment uh, on whatever we are, you know, trying to present here. Okay, so as of today, uh, we have taken 40 cases of COVID, which are completely cured, and there are several others that are currently ongoing. They're not completely better here. Over 1,200 uh, immunity boosters uh, is what we've given. Um, over... Uh, 900 of them are with Campora 1M and the rest are Arsenic Alpin 30. We've also seen a lot of cases with our, you know, flu lie and a lot of panic, you know, current patients who are just panicking or who are just sensing that, oh, something is wrong with them, something is wrong with them and things like that. Um, wanted to know, uh, to let you know and share this experience specifically is 
with these immunity boosters that we've given, you know, the, the Campura 1M or, or the arsenic album that we gave to people, out of these 1200, we're trying to, you know, follow up with them. So far, uh, and this is showing three, but I heard of two more cases recently. Uh, uh, so only five patients uh, uh, actually became COVID positive. And out of those five, the three patients who are under direct, our, our direct care, uh, they were all helped with uh, homeopathy. Uh, they were in quarantine centers. One of them actually went to the ICU too, but she came back. She recovered really well after over a week of uh, SPO2 less than uh, ranging between 80 to 85. Uh, but out of these 1,200, only five, which I think is a good sign, right? It, it's encouraging, uh, personally speaking. So certain practicalities, uh, especially for the junior homeopaths here, but unless you have the setup and the provisions, uh, use online mode of consultations for COVID cases. It's important that you take care of yourself so that you can start, you can help more number of people, yeah? Uh, those who have access to COVID hospitals, you know, designated COVID hospitals and quarantine centers also, it's important that you, you have quick case taking, history taking uh, methodologies. Also, I've seen uh, sometimes it's, you're not able to uh, speak to the patient himself or herself, yeah, because they are in some other country, other time zone, or they're severely ill, etc. doesn't matter. Speak to the relative, they should be able to give you some key symptoms, uh, take some key three, four symptoms, or give at least camphora 1M. So just because you are not able to elicit history, do not feel shy or hesitate to prescribe. Um, it helps. Treat the family along with patients. We've had at least five such cases where everybody in the family got exposed. So don't treat the patient in isolation, treat the family. Keep a close follow up for at least seven days. Reassure your patients and make quick decisions. Do not hesitate to change remedies. If you think there is no change in the next one or two days, change, change, change the medicines. If you're going to put your medicine, because that's what we're doing, at least put your three, four set of remedies so that you can you can play with these remedies and you don't, don't waste time. So these are certain practicalities. Advise people to have a temperature monitoring and an oxygen monitoring or you know like a pulse oximeter handy with them keep a parallel channel open with a physician unless you are able to rule out anybody who has these typical symptoms keep a close watch yeah keep uh, treat them with vigilance advise them to self quarantine a lot of us here in india you know how uh, how we can be with self quarantine there will be practical challenges with small houses etc and also the attitude sometimes so uh, always advise that uh, home remedies we all do it i mean for us i think the padhas and everything is part of our culture and routine that helps and be available on phone and chat i think right now is the time more, um, especially people who are symptomatic be available yeah common questions quick history taking uh, general state what has been the chronology of how the symptoms came and what with what pace they develop yeah how how quickly did the symptoms develop the grade of weakness you know just to quickly rule out what is the grade of anxiety or the attitude towards illness you know is the patient absolutely okay or is the patient absolutely very very anxious and uh, panicky you know the fever totality the thirst peculiar concomitants ailments body pain, I mean, all of this you know, but you know, the, the chronology, the pace, and just rule out what is the grade of weakness we are looking at, what is the grade of anxiety we are looking at, and other peculiar acute um, symptom pathology that we always generally take. Uh, Dr. Shankaran, uh, uh, you know, he, he presented this um, sometime back um, with Dr. Uh, Manchanda, I think. Uh, and he broadly categorized uh, the current uh, uh, set, the current pandemic into, you know, whether there are pandemic symptoms, whether there are peculiar acute, uh, uh, whether the, you know you see a peculiar acute symptom to totality, or whether it's a constitutional state, which is so true. You know, when he said that, it kind of suddenly 
we actually retrospectively went back and tried to categorize our cases and we thought it's so amazingly true uh, and in our experience we have seen both camphora and arsenic valgum uh, work equally well i am unable at this point in time prajakta and i are unable to say that camphora is better uh, is working more often than arsenic or otherwise we 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 were we had to use both these remedies uh, equally in these covid positive cases of patients who were high risk or suspected other common remedies that we have used is gelsemium bryonia phosphorus china china ars alcitla and very less frequently rustox and of course there are constitutional cases and those constitutional remedies could be anything but some of the remedies that we use are put it there on this slide also uh, what we uh, want to say is just the theory of ruling out you know just quickly if you can rule out if there is no restlessness rule out rustox arsenic if there is no periodicity no irritability uh, rule out china rule out uh, if you don't see dryness irritability rest desire then can't think of bryonia and you can't think of camphor camphor or arsenic if the patient is absolutely happy not caring about the disease there is no weakness yeah uh, and in our experience if we were unable to take any history i have uh, you know a distant relative three of them admitted in the civil hospital in uh, uh, verawal gujarat i was not they were not ready to give me any history and it, it was impossible to do anything just start them with camphor one and it has worked it has worked in all the cases where we have done uh so certain uh, before i get into cases uh, certain and a lot of masters have spoken endlessly about this i'm not going to be taking a lot of your time but just quickly sudden collapse numbness anesthesia panic the first class of class uh, symptoms of the plant family and coldness in some way or the other these would be somewhere covered in your case yeah Rekvik, I think, beautifully puts that uh, congestive coryza, catal irritation, uh, laryngeal and tracheal mucosa, dry coughs, constrictions in the chest, and rapid depression of neural activity or pulmonary or cardiac activity with sudden weakness. Yeah, so that is beautifully said. Arsenic album, heat stage is predominant. Heat stage uh, is longer, and there's a lot of burning. thirsty frequent thirst small sips weakness mental restlessness and despair of recovery there will be periodicity there will be worse at night and agonizing fear of death yeah so why why we are using so much arsenic we are using so much camphora and in india there was a huge debate at some point of you know what should we be using so what we try to do is what are the key differentiators between arsenic and camphora yeah burning pains better by heat surface of the body is cold painfully sensitive cannot bear to be covered slightest touch hurts weakness is with restlessness and anxiety show this sudden and complete prostration yeah so that is sudden and it's complete prostration so a lot more weakness a lot more prostration that you will see in tempo aggravation after midnight lying on affected sites cold food and drinks they are aggravated by cold air night motion lying cover heat in general except headache is their amelioration so also warm drinks we i'll 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 talk about those cases you know in the fever if there is fever the patient would take warm like take warm water like lukewarm water and that warm fluids once he, he or she would take that she was ameliorated both husband and wife had the same symptom they would take warm drinks and the fever would subside so ma yeah uh, in here in tempura warm covering drinking cold water and thinking of complaint periodicity is much more marked in arsenic not so marked in tempura there are the time aggravation that we already know about and the thirst we know about of arsenic very typical and tempura you will not hear so much about thirst in the patient okay bryonia we all know dryness excessive thirst irritability not wanting to be disturbed slightest movement aggravates and lying on the painful side and aggravates it's a small uh, screenshot of uh, dr dhanipkar's book on fever we were able to get hold of that and he also mentioned this talks about business and slightest motion aggravates and dull child 
wants to be carried etc yeah jealousy is very interesting chills with thirstlessness general prostration very similar to gamphora uh, you you should be able to differentiate what is the level of anxiety what is the level of prostration okay and chilliness felt in the back or the spine this is so typical and we had this one patient sajita you remember she actually said this words you know i feel there's a cold spot in my spine like you know the back of the spine very typical increase urination chill delivery yeah and also the same thing is mentioned here in allen's uh, uh, fever phosphorus cheerful thirsty cold drink they really even in fever they will ask for cold drinks weather changes especially now with the monsoon you know getting uh, uh, you know wet in rain will you know bring on a lot of symptoms we seen a lot of cases like that um like rustox think of phosphorus if you have ailments from us getting wet in rain yeah so key differentiators again in terms of camphora gelsemium phosphorus speech broken feeble speech is thick as if drunk can hardly speak and here the speech is difficult the weakness camphora we know the sudden collapse the mental anguish and anxiety and inner anxiety here there is tiredness there is heaviness the lids also feel heavy weakness soreness especially in muscles and extremities and there is not so much marked weakness in phosphorus and then we know that you know how the respiratory complaints of all these things and these are okay so this cases that we are now going to share we'll, we have just put it in bucket the first bucket as i said the epidemic you know how uh, dr shankaran would put it as you know symptoms that are prevailing to the pandemic we put all the cases of arsenic and camphor i hope so this was our very first patient of covid positive uh, we, we shared uh, also it's on h15 we shared it a couple of times she was this patient in uk she was a nurse and she was treating i mean she was uh, directly exposed to covid patients and, and there was lot of i mean the main weakness uh, uh, exhibited in her speech that she was hardly barely able to speak uh, 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 you know otherwise she would say i'm okay but her loss of speech i mean so much frustration that even her speech was not okay she was in and out in and out of hospitals a couple of times and she did tremendously well with camphora 1 and uh, it took around 10 11 days for her to completely recover with camphora but her main i mean despite along with everything else that was typical her weakness more than her body i mean she was not like that but her main weakness was you know kind of it exhibited in the speech this complete lack of speech you know so much that they thought it's a stroke you know she had to undergo ct scan for that uh, so this extreme fatigue unable to speak oh, and these couple of breathless episodes were our key indications to give her camphora one yeah she did extremely well these are her reports okay so speech and voice broken difficult speech weakness debility with uh, these were certain symptoms and key indicators for us for camphor this is the second case uh, uh, again uh, for this case uh, we gave this guy uh, this uh, this patient of ours he was just 20 years old nursing um, a covid positive mother and eventually he he became covid positive he had symptoms he was admitted in the hospital uh, extreme anxiety and panic um, all and he would just just keep calling prajakta and dr manali yeah he would call both of them simultaneously and message both of them simultaneously they were confused who's getting the first message yeah so uh, extremely clinging and uh, uh, there was a lot of weakness along with it which was helped with uh, uh, with camphora one this is the third patient uh, uh, with, you know uh, that we that was really helped with camphora one and his uh, so both husband and wife 50 50 uh, you know in the age of early 50s the wife actually passed away with because of covid you know i mean uh, they suddenly started developing symptoms and um, it was difficult for them to find bed in the hospital and eventually when they found the km hospital the wife's uh, uh, spo2 you know was in a, in 60s if i'm not uh, if i'm not wrong right prajakta when we first gave her camphora and it was too late 
yeah so she uh, she hardly received one or two doses of camphor but she passed the day and uh, husband we were able to help because he 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 started sim, you know taking medicines much before not at the very end stage he was just panicking he was just crying and he was emotionally very very weak he was only only crying uh, and he started developing breathlessness he started uh, you know uh, having lots of headaches and dizziness uh, that we could in the nagar hospital and he was helped with camphor uh, one and complete uh, uh okay this next patient uh, uh, again she was high risk so uh, she was admitted in the somaya hospital she lived in a red uh, hot spot in uh, mumbai in sain area and she had lots of dry cough one very typical symptom that she said is that i mean in her build apartment building there were so many cases you know they would just keep hearing the ambulance come and go so every some time the bmc you know uh, would come and sanitize the building so after the sanitization of the entire building the, uh, you know what the people uh, the residents of that building would do they would clean it with water you know they put a lot of water and they'll clean the entire building premises once they did not do it and that strong odor of sanitization post that she developed fever and chill this was so peculiar you know uh, none of the patients till that time had ever told that and there were other peculiar symptoms of thirst and lot of anxiety and breathlessness so she was uh, she was helped with arsenic alcohol specifically if you see you know generality strong odor that was covered by arsenic and uh, of course there was periodicity and there were other typical symptoms of arsenic but why out of all the other remedies why we picked arsenic was this um, this strong odors aggravation rajita you want to talk about this patient uh, yes yes okay so um so this was a patient uh, who was our existing patient and um, he is to stay in a dense area where there were lot of uh, covid positive cases and um, uh, we were observing him since uh, many days you know he was he used to just feel very very anxious no symptoms nothing and he will just come up with the anxiety and he'll keep calling us and uh, you know uh, talking about okay I, you know i'm getting this i'm getting this today this, this today and all these symptoms so we were observing this since long time and then um, uh, suddenly i uh, he one fine day he called and uh, told us that you know uh, his mother uh, became positive and then uh, he started feeling more anxious more more anxious and for his especially for his mother as well as for his health and then he next day he got the test done he came also positive he went to the quarantine center he had uh, symptoms after this uh, you know with cough with expectoration with pain in the chest with lot of anxiety and lot of uh, assurance you know he would need and he would ask for it and continuously nothing was you know actually helping his anxiety also he had typical thirst which is increased for small quantities of water and um, appetite during the fever has increased and lot of anxiety which is felt and depending on this uh, we had given arsenic album uh, one hourly and i think day, day one so in the in the quarantine center uh, uh, they were not uh, giving him much of the uh, medicines so we could send the medicines to him in the quarantine center and he was just taking this and the multivitamins and the the vitamins that were given to him arsenic had really helped uh, him there was no recurrence of fever uh, and appetite came back to normal in day 2 anxiety also reduced further and he was communicating with us for uh, his mother who was also under our treatment uh, for the covid on third day there was no anxiety no fever and he was you know quite settled so there was as and when he was improving we um, lessened down the frequency uh, for the repetition and um, then later on he on on day 4 he felt much better only then uh, we just repeated him twice a day and he was in the um, quarantine center so we continued uh, at least once a day prescription and i think on eighth day he got discharged from the 
center so he he could uh, you know really help with arsenic uh, a lot with the um, this whole acute episode of his so we can see the um, rubrics uh, along with uh, the cough fever during expectoration white chest pain cough during and weakness extreme thirst all these were covering with um, arsenic yeah and then uh, this is for his uh, mother and uh, who uh, was who is also our patient she was a known case of diabetes and hypertension very obese uh, lady and um, basically she manifested uh, with the recurrent fever with weakness and she has a high grade of fever with sudden weakness so basically we wanted to talk to her or we want to get symptoms for her but you know she was she was so weak that she was unable to give any symptoms or, or anything that uh, you know we could get from her so uh, we relied on the um, patient's relative which mentioned that there was a lot of difficulty in breathing and um, uh, she was uh, uh, in the quarantine center on ventilator her sugar level had increased her uh, spo2 was um, very very low like it was coming below 19 so with the, with the extreme um, weakness we prescribed her camphora 1m hourly in water and um, we we took the follow up on day 2 and 3 the weakness improved a lot then um, uh, she was still on ventilator because spo2 spo2 was not rising they did a ct scan uh, for her and uh, the ct scan showed pneumonia and pleural effusion and um, that was something uh, we really wanted to uh, you know work on uh, so on day 4 the weakness persisted breathlessness also persisted and then he shifted to the icu for further care and then she was critical and then at that time we thought you know because there were no symptoms and camphora has helped her in the initial thing we we are we thought of increasing we consulted uh, doctors also senior what to be done you know so that time the, we we increased the potency you know the camphora 10m we prescribed half an hour early i think we had a senior doctor on the call here yes. so we, you know sometimes the, it's important we we need to get reassured so we we, we spoke to dr balvinder sir and he said stick to it if you are not able to get anything just increase the potency so yeah mm -hmm. and um, so we continued her with camphora uh, on day 5 6 7 all of them one hourly repetition and so i said that if there is improvement just reduce the frequency so we repeated 5 6 7 days one hourly and on the eight days we saw that the pleural effusion gradually reduced the sugar level also started um, coming down drastically on day 8 her spo spo2 levels also increased to 96 to 97 which was never the you know above 90 and the ventilator was removed weakness improved the sugar levels also were maintained and her breathlessness also improved and then 9 to 11 days she further improved with camphora 10m with frequent repetition and she was there in the hospital for almost 20 days but she recovered completely with camphora 10m yeah this was this was something that's very very challenging for us to but yeah she could do very well these were her reports um and the the initial reports that mentioned uh, the pleural effusion and the um, pneumonia and on the discharge um, she was well and now she she has um, she still we we are still prescribing her medicine camphora and i think she is doing very well with that yeah okay you want to talk about this case too prajakta running yes. for the train like vdlj yes uh, so this was something um, which was very interesting so uh, he uh, uh, so um, his wife was our patient and um, one fine day she called us uh, to uh, you know and 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 gave a history which was like very very unique 
for us. So she mentioned that um, because, and the patient was so shy. Um, his son was also our patient. So whenever we, so uh, I remember that when she said that because she, he, the patient didn't want to talk to us for any history, you know. He was so shy. He was saying, okay, my, my uh, wife will give all the information about me. Um, and they were like, you know, they were communication, uh, like they were uh, Tamilians. So he was explaining into, uh, you know, Tamil language and she was describing me in the English. So all those was very, very uh, unique. But yeah, so she mentioned that, um, you know, uh, he, um, he used to work in railway. And um, one fine day, it was the last uh, uh, train or something like that. And then he had to run for that train. So he used to work on the station. So from the office to the to catch that train so he was uh, he was running after that he ran so fast after that he started developing these symptoms so you know he couldn't breathe he had sudden dry tiredness after coming home and he the main important thing was just the tiredness and he had a high fever of uh, 102 he also has headache which was mild but uh, better after taking steam and feverish and weak, you know, and wanted to just lie down. He was just used to just lie down and um, thirst. He had thirsty. Otherwise, he used to be thirstless. He wanted fan and uh, he was, he was uh, not chilly, not perspiring, no dry throat, no cough, no cold, no breathing difficulty, none other symptoms. So we started uh, him with camphora 1M and water dose one hourly for two days and then two hourly after two days. So he could re recover, fever subsided, and then his weakness also improved. And then he was asking, you know, now uh, only after three days and four days, he was saying, can I resume to my work? And, you know, he was so better with that. And he was so amazed uh, to see that. But we asked him to quarantine himself for at least uh, eight days and then he resumed the work and he's doing really well now. So, Kathy, we have an Indian Bollywood movie which is extremely, it's, it's the longest, longest running movie in theatres. Okay, it's a, it's a romantic film in which the, 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 the actress, she basically, she's missing a train and she runs, runs, runs and the hero, you know, gives her hand and, you know, she, she's able to take the train and that's when, that's how the love story begins. So... Uh, that was the joke that, you know, it was very typical. The pa this patient who works in railways and he's taking the last train back home and he's running, running, running to take it and sudden collapse and starts with fever chills post this episode. Yeah. So very typical. And that was the fun. All right. Going to the next one. Uh, it just moves. Okay. Rajiv, I'm being a little conscious of time, so maybe you want to just uh, increase your pace of time. You're talking on mute. You're mute. Yeah. So um, this was um, one patient who got, we got a reference, and um, uh, he got symptoms one day before we consulted. He got wet in the ra rain, and there was mild fever of 99 to 101, which was up, going up and down. He had cold uh, and the headache, cough also, dry cough, which used to come on and off. Perspiration was there in front of uh, his neck during fever. And then he had uh, taken covering with the fan. Thirst was normal. He had some uh, runny nose. And um, in fever state also, he could work. You know, there was no uh, kind of irritation. Um, and there was mainly this cough, which, uh, you know, dry as said, and at night. And because of which he was awake without, uh, he, because of which he was awake. And it was without the expectoration. The appetite was good and he used to feel hungry. And then it was just a bitter taste in his mouth. So we started uh, Camphora 1M at regularly interval because we didn't have much of the symptom. But once he had a fever spike, after which he was feeling better. No fever again. Cough was still there for two, three days. But then we repeated camphora or like one hourly interval and that cough also subsided. The next one was 
also he um, he had fever and after two, two three days and he was an antibiotic course and then the fever has subsided only weakness was there and he didn't he used to feel chilly during the fever stage sweating was there on the chest and forehead um ajay your voice is cracking up for me it's like uh, you want to try again uh, yeah and uh, now is it okay no, no it's it's very bad actually i don't know the is a can everybody else hear prajukta well uh okay so no okay prajukta maybe just uh, okay try it again is it okay now is no. it on no, it is not so maybe you'll have to you want to just try in a bit i i'll take this case yeah yeah, yeah. so i think this was uh, this patient had typical thirst for you know small quantities of water and uh, he was on antibiotics but not recovering and the weakness was not going yeah and uh, he used to feel chilly before the fever stage and there was a lot of sweating that was accompanied uh, we started him with arsenic album and he was better with it the main also the indication was this typical bitter taste in the mouth which he kept saying which was very annoying for him so that also was quite typical uh, and one of the reasons why we chose uh, uh, arsenic album for this patient okay uh, so majority of our covid positive patients were taken care by arsenic album or camphor yeah and the key differentiators we we shared this in the beginning some second bucket you know some other common remedies and sort some cases uh, from that uh, for all of you to consider is uh, there's this one lady uh, known case of diabetic uh, uh, she had uh, a long uh, history you know i mean she was not well uh, for a long time she had a, a, a stomach upset and you know she had some outside fish uh, post which she started developing loose motions and she was on treatment for a long time with fever and lots of vomiting and lots of diarrhea etc absolutely no desire to uh, uh, to eat etc okay so she came to us uh, uh, so you know her symptoms started from 9th may and then she came to us on the first time that we saw her was on the 15th of may and there was lots of dry cough lot of breathlessness and she would she just pace around in the house you know from one place to another she just keep pacing she say i'm well i want to go out uh, inside the house she would say you know i need fresh air you know in marathi kundla sarkha vatte you know feeling suffocated inside and with all these symptoms so many diarrhea like 10 to 12 times and um, uh, she has a common toilet yeah i mean she would have to use a common toilet and go so imagine in the middle of night also she it soiled the floor a couple of times so so bad but she would still be so restless pacing around the house and very typical the 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 son said you know that her cough her breath smells bitter everything in the room smells bitter and uh, we rapid tried this and with all of the symptom totality chinima mask was given to her she was in the hospital for several days her rescue to drop etc and she was better with chinimum arsenic yeah she said she is well my arsenic covers this rubric well says he is when very sick you know with that anxiety you would also have this uh, um so which was quite um, uh and then the rectum diarrhea started uh, after taking fish respiration breath as if from want of i'm looking for a rubric which said uh, one second uh, difficult exertion respiration difficult lying aggravates respiration difficult lying ameliorates and irritability with fever um, so with all of that we gave uh, we, you know arsenic was coming very high and you also see ch china over here somewhere if you read in fatok chinimum as weakness weariness prostration and disinclination for mental work very irritable um, eggs and fish produce diarrhea uh, eggs and fish produce diarrhea you know that is why we thought with this periodicity with this irritability uh, and so much weakness and breathlessness and this typical bitterness uh, um, that's how we thought of minimum arts in this patient did really well with that 
uh, this second case uh, i want to share um, and this is very recent uh, i don't know rajit if he's still in the nesco quarantine center or he got discharged so basically very 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 affectionate and mild person he got wet in the rain and since then he started developing fever so you know uh, uh, it was a whatsapp video call okay the case history and the brother was only giving the symptoms hardly this poor thing got any chance to speak so we had to you know uh, uh, we took the entire history with you know the two of them and after some time when we were analyzing and repertorizing and rajita and i were discussing are we hardly got any symptoms so we had to call that patient separately because you know we came to the brother's remedy of arsenic rather than the actual patient's remedy uh, due to the case so he was such a mild guy um, uh, of course worried about the uh, about the family and everything started after getting wet in rain there was lot of thirst and a lot of desire to have cold water yeah so these were so typical symptoms um, and uh, that is how we we decided to give him phosphorus and uh, he's doing extremely well he's you know just about to get discharged any time so very sentimental anxiety getting wet after symptoms and wanting this cold water and large quantity of water thirst for so that is how we came to phosphorus and it really helped i think this is his report which says he was covid positive etc uh now this is the next case that we wanted to share um, ajit you want to talk about this one uh, if your mic is working now just see me was the remedy for this one yeah can you hear me is my did you try uh, going like log out and log back in it's still cracking okay uh, let me let me do that yeah okay so i'll continue then in the interest of time so this uh, was both husband and wife and this the, the symptoms really started when uh, you know they they went on a long ride close to 300 kilometers picked their son up on bike okay and there was this draft you know uh, of cold air as well as it was very sunny this was a case in may uh, which is the peak of summer right here uh and that's when the symptoms started so both husband and this was the patient uh, which also made prajakta go into quarantine for 14 days uh this was a uh, physically we saw this patient uh, she saw this patient uh, to be precise uh so what happened was you know both of them uh the husband was covid positive the child uh, he gave prophylactic so never turned positive uh so the wife was like this on the husband's shoulder she was so weak she could barely stand so between the consultation room and the waiting area she would set up and stand she would sit up and stand you know when you enter inside again once the medicines are made and you're just double checking on how to take the medicine at that time also for that you know half of a minute also she would sit she was so dull she was so drowsy and her eyelids were actually drooping um and there's this very marked chilliness in the back of the neck and down the back and this great chilliness uh, and this was so typical of uh, gelsinum we spoke about it earlier at the beginning of our presentation too, right so she was really uh, gelsinum was frequently repeated and she did extremely well with gelsinum uh, uh, the second i mean this next one is uh, her husband and uh, this uh, the patient uh, had typical i mean it was a similar history right they both went on a bike ride etc so very difficult to manage this patient we had to change so many remedies um uh, you know we started with china we switched to arsenic album then we went to camphora uh, and then finally bryonia was the remedy that helped um uh, this typical pain and restlessness and he didn't want to talk you know it was so difficult to get any history from him and if you would ask you know like uh, if manal dr manali would ask him a couple of times something he would also be a little rude or irritable to answer that and this huge quantity of water that he drank you know uh, so that was our indication to give him bryonia this is his reports on hrct uh they figured that you know it was covid like uh, test presentation of the lungs so this guy was helped with uh, this guy was helped with uh, bryonia yeah 
uh, this one patient i wanted to talk about one year old child you know living with a covid positive uh, uncle yeah a small house uh, living with a family uh, and he started having 101 102 fever and it was not getting better okay and had typical i mean was irritable constantly crying the you know and of course he, the child was breastfeeding still and he would not leave the mother the mother had to always carry her he was the mother said you know maybe his hands and legs are aching a little bit uh, and if i would massage his hands and legs he would feel a little better okay um, how, his you know he was not feeding that well, well that much or uh, there no perspiration and we started him on actually eupatorium because only there were fever mark symptoms yeah and there is lots of body pains etc but it did not help we immediately switched uh, him to pulsatilla and uh, because of the thirst reduction and the scary desire to etc the child did extremely well on uh, pulsatilla and these were some of the symptoms that we took you know the irritability also fever during uh, was the only thing that pulsatilla didn't cover uh but rest everything else um, was covered by pulsitna in, in one, one typical other symptom was you know the eyes would water a lot during fever that is another thing that the, uh, the mother said okay uh just doing a quick time check okay we have another let's say close to 15 minutes and i want to give some time for discussion and also to see if uh anybody would like to share your experiences etc so very quickly the third bucket is about constitutional remedies where you don't see any acute peculiar symptoms uh, but you see that the constitutional state prevails yeah so i've given some example here of uh, lactis patient but i mean this is not one size fit all right so if you see that there are not many acute or different symptoms the constitutional remedy will always help and also has helped us in several cases uh just one quick uh, some quick examples on treating families where you will see so many same same things but yet there are different things yeah uh, it happens uh, so just wanted to share this uh, a couple of such examples to uh, who are covid positive uh, and prajita if you are back just let me know um, so she could also share some of the examples so uh, this is uh, this is a family of husband and wife and um, uh, uh, the husband was working in a bank uh, and he had a direct exposure he he shared lunch with somebody who was covid positive and he started developing symptoms uh, he had this typical 12 hourly fever you know at 4 am and at 4 pm he had lots of body ache he was thirsty and he was ameliorated by drinking hot water he was really better as soon as the heat stage would start he would start taking hot water and with that hot water he will start perspiring and he would feel better and this was so typical of arsenic and we gave him arsenic and he was better uh, these are the symptoms of uh, the rubric uh, the repetries that uh, oops, uh, uh, the rubrics that we took the wife on the other hand she also had typical uh, you know uh, there was a periodicity she also had 4 am 4 pm she also had body ache but she was extremely thirsty and she had this bitter taste in the mouth which would not go yeah and she had lots of headaches and lots of pains which were better with you know massage so uh, while there were so many common symptoms what was different was the bitter taste in mouth this headache this uh, this lot of thirst um uh, and that's how you know uh, the same family one person got uh, arsenic and the other person uh, and the wife got uh, uh, bryonia and, and they were better uh the second family example you know everybody in this family from the housemaid to the grandfather uh, to the husband wife and the child they all uh, turned uh, i mean of course the child was not uh, tested but they all turned covid positive they were all symptomatic the husband i mean the the father uh, of the small child he was mainly the caregiver he had to take care he he was the one responsible to take the spo2 in every one hour for everybody or stay up in the nights to make sure everybody's temperature is being monitored or everybody gets the you know whatever is required because the mother i mean his wife and the child were quarantined in one bedroom 
while he was in another bedroom the maid was in another you know the maid's uh, quarters and uh, and the grandfather was eventually then hospitalized because he was not able to take care of everybody in the house so he just felt exhausted and exasperated by just taking care of everybody yeah so first because we thought there was so much weakness and everything we started him with uh, uh bryo you know camphora we gave him bryo yeah, but then didn't, didn't do that well and finally his hrct was done and he had those typical lung presentation yeah and then uh, he uh, at one point he said you know he likes cold drinks that you know the water he, he he's so exhausted he has to sit in the afternoon and say okay now i'm tired it's time for myself drink lots of water and take cold water that will make me feel better so he was finally given phosphorus and he really recovered well from phosphorus uh, it was repeated thrice in a day uh this is his daughter uh and she also she was she was quarantined in one bedroom with the mother and she was so cheerful and you know whenever the fever would come that time also she would keep playing okay and uh, she was so interactive she spoke to us on zoom etc also and she was so interactive only during that fever when when the fever would spike up she would be a little dull still continue playing uh but rest you know she likes ice creams and chocolates her constitutional medicine is like delphine during this acute episode uh, she was really helped with her uh, phosphorus and uh, and repetitive doses yeah um this checking on prajukta prajukta you're there you want to talk about this last group of family Okay, let me see. She's unable to un. Oh, okay. Okay. Am I audible? Yes, and much better. Okay. So okay. maybe quickly. So yes. Um, yes. yes. So this was a family. Um, uh, we were already treating uh, uh, his son, and um, they both they all uh, like the father had a symptom, the the husband. and uh, the wife they they had symptom and um, that is how they connected to us so the father uh, he had lots of fatigue and tiredness and extremely anxious regarding this covid and then he was quarantining himself in the room and very particular of wearing gloves and very very particular you know he will uh, he will call also on particular time and uh, he take all the vitals he tell ev like every day in the uh, night at 9 o'clock he will call and will very particular and very weird guy so he he'll talk more about himself rather than talking about the kids and all and um, very chilly patient uh, mouth would go dry still thirstless he had perspiration mostly on the neck and the forehead and uh, appetite has reduced and he recovered so with with all these uh, symptoms we had given him arsenic album his anxiety had reduced markedly and fever spikes also and cough also reduced but it's still weakness you know there was something that he was actually uh, you know nagging and talking about it so that time we thought the weakness was not covered with arsenic we gave him camphora one m which helped him to recover from completely uh, from his weakness and then he was asymptomatic and then now he's uh, you know returned to his work too so these two combination of the remedies has really helped him and now when um, you treat he was also her, given lactases at some point right prajukta yeah yes yes so lactases i think once uh, we'd given him uh, that then um, that helped him some extent but the main weakness covered with camphora hmm? and then uh, uh, with his wife um, uh, we had um, so the yeah so with the wife uh, she had uh, very very uh, mild symptoms uh, she had fever uh, extreme weakness unable to do anything and um, she would you know she would just feel like lying down and rest um, and lot of headache with fever thirst she had large quantities of water and a sweat and after the sweat uh, the fever is to subside and then she had uh, this symptom of dizziness you know she used to feel dizzy and kind of uh, you know losing her balance because of the weakness she felt hungry all the time 
yeah thermally hot during the fever stage and um, she would want covering with fan or a or ac off and then with because of the weakness and the uh, dizziness and the uh, what i go basically we started uh, her on gilsimim 1m one hourly and i think the fever uh, you know subsided uh, down two days and she felt more energetic than before and weakness also settled with gilsimim then uh, these uh, the, the kids were our uh, existing patients so they didn't have much of the symptoms but yeah they had sneezing the one son has sneezing and cough and low grade fever with diarrhea and then he was playful and you know very active throughout the day so we prescribed him uh, his uh, constitution remedy which was tarantula 1m and uh, later on uh, he had this uh, episode of one episode where he was very weak he was unable to drink or uh, you know take any food that time we have given him arsenic album and then uh, it recovered with this combination and now is asymptomatic another uh, uh, son um, you know he's got um, uh, he his activities were normal and uh, mild symptoms which were very very mild symptoms that he has appetite was good he was thirstless and uh, he and his brother understood his mother's direction and then he followed very well with calcarea cup that was also his um, constitutional remedy we gave him for uh, you know three times for two weeks continuously because you know uh, they all uh, had these symptoms so we continued the uh, medicine and he is much better he didn't develop any other uh, symptoms and they are all doing a perfectly um, well now so they are twin uh, brothers actually but one is tarantula mm -hmm. and one is calcarea cup so same same yet different yeah <laughs> that's how homeopathy is is in so that was a you know in short our uh, our experience with these cases i wanted to open up the floor to see if you had any questions any comments or if anybody of you would like to share your experiences uh including you kathy so uh, over to all of you if there's anything that you would like to share Kathy, uh, are you able to unmute yourself? Okay, uh, sorry, that was odd. Okay. So, anybody, anything? They are all either hungry or sleepy. Yeah, those who eat late dinners are hungry, <laughs> and the early dinners. Well, I can say this. Are... I can say this. Yeah. <laughs> Both pretty, for yeah. for you, pretty and and Pajakta, those were wonderful cases. Very very well presented. Thank you. I, I would like some notes <laughs> from 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 all that you shared. Thank you for all the work that you did. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Here, Rupal here. Hi, Dr. Rupal. Hi. Uh, beautiful cases, beautiful presentation. Kathy, thank you to you too also with such a elaborate and historical kind of a presentation. And I, we have prepared okay. camphora files of our homeopathy epicenter. Uh, they are kind of uh, corona files or camphora files as well. It is like synonymous mm -hmm. for us. We are sharing it uh, one by one. Already two files are shared. I will be sharing two more. And there is a lot of preventive files of arsenic alba also. So we'll, we are all updating regularly on our website and we'll share with you also if you want, email you, uh, so that you can keep sharing or spreading the word on your site, so wherever. Yeah, perfect. Uh, any interesting case, Dr. Rupal, that stands out or you would like to share either with Camphora or Sneak or anything? Uh, uh, yeah, there are many, but uh, I mean, as I said, there are files of cases of camphora only, more or less. But mm -hmm. the, the one of the cases which I want to talk about because it is not camphora is 
uh, the guy who was working in Surat Electricity Board. It's a government electricity board office where he is exposed to all type of people every day and many people with his own uh, office having 10 people positive almost around him. And he started getting fever. And he was the first one in the family to get fever and then kind of every other day his uh, some of the other family member would start getting fever. So quite positive it was Corona but we didn't get, ask him to go in for that because then he would have to quarantine and whatever, whatever. So... Uh, sorry. Yeah, are you able to hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Yeah. So then he had a unique history of undergoing uh, two episodes of dengue in the past five years where both the times his oxygen would go down with dengue and he was hospitalized for like hypoxia. So that having that history and this is one of the things I want to mention in COVID also that all the patients who have some typical history and they are not tested positive yet are having fever or we are suspecting COVID try to ask for other past histories. If malaria or dengue or other things are there then the prescription will not be kept for up possibly. Hmm. So in that case, the dengue history is very typical where Dr. Balvinder has shown results with ferrum phos 30. So okay. first, uh, they were on arsenical uh, as a preventive. They have been taking. So I told them to just continue because that was only homeopathy medicine they had for one day. And second day, the fever and body ache was still very much there. So we had to uh, put him on ferrum phos 30 every day, uh, every hourly, sorry. And then after that, uh, he was uh, the fever was uh, gone, the body ache was gone, and then just give, gave preventive camphora because his family members started having fever. So I told everyone else to take camphora and him also after that, just to in case if it is corona, he, it is also taken care of. So the history of dengue or malaria, then China or Peremphos, things like that also have to be considered, not just the routine medicines. Mm, that is very interesting to know. Ferrum first you said for dengue specifically. Yeah, okay. Dr. Balvinder and we have seen many cases in his clinic also. 30 every hourly for one or two days. Most of the dengue cases, even with the platelets down also come around very well. Mm. Or then maybe ferrum first 200 maybe if the need be. Okay, that's a great tip. Thank you for sharing that. Yo, yo. Uh, Dr. Geeta wanted to say something. Uh, Geeta? Gita, you want to unmute yourself? You can. Hello. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Good evening, uh, Preeti and Prajakta. And wonderful uh, webinar, really uh, excellent cases. And thanks to Dr. K uh, Kathy also, like she explained very well. Uh, I just wanted to share my uh, recent experience. Uh, 24 year old uh, uh, girl, she came with uh, uh, COVID positive and uh, like uh, uh, her mother is also a doctor, a homeopathic doctor. So as soon as uh, this uh, COVID, uh, listening to the COVID this thing, she started uh, Ginkovit and vitamin C, all those tablets and uh, not antibiotics with uh, uh, Dolo and uh, these things. And after uh, taking these medicines, uh, she uh, started like, you know, the uh, blood of acidity and she never took this uh, daily uh, three, two allopathic medicines. And uh, um, uh, so she developed indigestion and a lot of bitterness in mouth. And slowly and second day, complete loss of taste and complete uh, uh, loss of smell also. And along with that, uh, she said like, uh, whenever there is a fever, the fever, uh, she experienced the fever in, heat in the throat and extremities are cold. So I took rubric fever concomitants extremities cold and Forta repertory fever hands cold with. And extremities, coldness, fever during, and uh, uh, throat. She is also having throat pain. Also, whenever uh, she is following something, some stitching type of pain, and uh, taste bitter, fever during, and fever partial heat throat in. And she is a very mild girl. Pulse came, 
So I prescribe pulsatilla. So this case hold on for two days, like on pulsatilla itself. But on the fourth day, again, she develops uh, uh, diarrhea, like green color uh, diarrhea and uh, uh, slightly some uh, catching type of pain in chest. And she's getting relieved by uh, sleeping on abdomen. And she is feeling like hot, like you know, she wants fan also. So at the time, again, I changed. I, I took the new, I, I found these are a new set of symptoms. So I took sleep position abdominal, stool greenish, taste wanting lost, fever, heat, fan desire to be. Then the medicine came medorinum. So after giving medorinum one doses, Slowly, like uh, the fever uh, also like came down. Already she is having very low fever, only 100 and 101. And uh, slowly her taste and smell got better. But again lost, like uh, again uh, on eighth day and ninth day, she uh, she's uh, staying uh, like from many days to the you know alone in the room first time. No one is there uh, in the isolation. No one is there to talk. So she she all up some part, sort of anxiety, like what is happening? How many days I can sit? You know, I can sit in the room. A uh, bit, bit of restlessness and a bit of anxiety. And uh, at the time she become chilly, like she says that I don't want. Uh, a uh, fan and everything. So I repeated two doses of Arsal 30, one day. Then today is the 13th day. Actually, tomorrow is her pending COVID second test. So now she's doing perfectly all right. Her taste and her smell came back. No fever, no chest pain, and no throat pain. She's doing very well. Uh, uh, in, my, in my experience, very few cases are holding with uh, one drug. And uh, the rest of the cases, like every two days, every three days, like, you know, I, uh, the picture is like uh, changing, like few cases. So in this way, this is a very recent case of mine. So I just thought of sharing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Geeta, for sharing. Mm -hmm. So we are on the top of the hour. Thank you so much for all of you. Thank you, Kathy, for sharing. Uh, uh, you know, your wisdom and your experiences that was very, very helpful. Um, sure. uh, any last thoughts, Project Kathy? Last thoughts. I, I love being, ha having been able to be a part of this. I love what I can learn from you homeopaths in India. This is tremendous. I, 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 what I'm actually finding that I'd like to do is I'd like, I'd like to find a place here in the United States where there are actually cases many cases of of, of the COVID-19 happening because they're, they're just I don't see many of them around here I've helped a, a case up in Seattle which is you know a couple thousand miles away but I just I, I love how particular and how closely it, it's further you are all working it's further testimony to me of the strength of the medicine of homeopathy and I think one of the things I didn't uh, emphasize uh, in my presentation was just the real need that I feel we should begin emulating with within homeopathy is just yeah we've got to be cautious about disease we've got to be careful about disease we've got to be knowledgeable about disease too don't be fearful about it because that fear promulgates fear fear makes you susceptible to just about anything and I think when, when approaching our, our, our patients with the confidence that we have, that we should always have because we have homeopathy. It'll emulate, it'll resonate, it'll, it'll echo with those that, with whom we're working. And I think it's really gonna be very positive as we move forward. I'm very excited about all that I've learned from these wonderful cases that you've shared too. Thank you all, thank, thank you. Rajita? Yeah, so um, it was really nice. Um, and before presentation, and um, we also did a lot of <coughs> Uh, it was really a uh, great insight for us too. Uh, what um, uh, what the basic uh, thing what we understood is uh, even if uh, they get better or uh, you know they are asymptomatic, what we are doing we are we are still uh, you know keeping the follow up with them to see if there is any recurrence or if people with uh, you know having changes in the lungs or any report like you know the. Uh, x-ray or any CT scan showing the reports 
uh, and some changes in that it's very important to keep a follow up with them to see if they're doing better or if there are any difficulties that are coming up. so it's it's going to be an ongoing Absolutely. process uh, i think yeah. so yeah so you know we'll we'll keep updating our uh, knowledge medicines as uh, geeta also mentioned there can be some change in the picture or there might be recurrence you know so it's going to be very very um, dynamic i feel you know to mm -hmm. uh, deal these uh, cases and to learn a lot of things from it yeah so thank you once again uh, thank you for sharing your peace of mind uh, for those of you uh, who joining musings for the first time our musings are generally first and third saturdays of the month the upcoming musing is on uh, reptiles it's a continuation of what we had last time this is our email id for your quick reference which is on the 5th of september the next sa session oops i don't know what you're seeing um here it is and uh, we are also starting with second mondays of every month uh, for difficult cases so if you have a difficult case and you want advice and supervision or want to just discuss with some senior homeopaths this is going to be the forum that you would like to uh, join into and this is our email id so once again thank you so much and i'll let you go it was too long hours stretch your back and you know grab something to eat or drink or uh, Thank you once again. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Thank you bye. all. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.